so I want to talk about the seekers and I want to talk about the skeptics. So let's talk about the seekers first. We need to understand that good as it is for us to sit down and talk about the Bible and talk about the reason for the faith that lies in us and talk about what we call by biology the doctrine of the Bible, we need to understand that sinners with few exceptions come to faith in Jesus before the, their bibliology is all formulated. We need to understand that when we come to Christ, okay, we don't have it all sorted out. At the point of salvation, it's not about proving the Bible. That is not where we started. Okay, now there are, there are exceptions to the rule. There are some people that because they are they because they're academicians because they are scholars because of the type of life they live they have to struggle with quite a number of questions those are few most of us when we became born again the issue at the point of salvation for us was not trying to prove the revelation and the inspiration and the transmission what we are talking about now no most of us don't didn't come to Christ with that, okay? And it is very important for me to establish this, that when most of us got born again, we come to faith when confronted with Christ, portrayed in the Bible, and witnessed by the Christian. At the point of salvation, what the Holy Spirit confronted us with was with Christ, portrayed in the Bible, preached to us the gospel that is preached to us and witnessed for us in the life of Christian. And the way we come to Christ is God being revealed to us in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is after we get born again and we are growing in our faith that we actually start progressing in in faith and start talking about biology and other things that we are talking about now i think this is very very important for us to establish we need to put what we are saying in his best in, in his in his right position what must drive this desire to be able to be convinced in our own heart in our own life that the bible is the word of God that the Bible is the infallible and the inerrant word of God what must drive that is actually the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ through the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit okay and that is the heart of Christianity it's not really our ability to prove that this is that or that is this. Now, that is important, don't misunderstand me, but we need to understand that the core of our faith, the core of our faith is really the message. It's really the revelation of God in the face of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost. As seekers, as Christians, that is our heart. Now. Obviously, it is very, very important for us to then be able to have faith in the scripture. Now, it is very important for me to, un to, to underscore this. We must understand that it is the revelation of Jesus that gives the Bible his authority. Now, this is very important. Okay, it is the revelation, the power. The revelation of God in Christ Jesus that is ours for us in the Bible, that gave the Bible his authority, that gave the Bible his, his power. And this is very important. And we've mentioned some of these things. Now, obviously, the devil will want to come behind the, 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 the door to try to prove that the Bible is not the word of God. And by so doing, trying to overthrow the faith of many. Now, we know the Bible is the Word of God, but it is very, very important for you and I to understand that this is the, as it were, this is the way we do it. This is the right arrangement. Christ, God first, God revealed himself. God revealed himself in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that revelation is housed for us in the Scripture. And it is very, very important for us to actually put that in order. Now, that is us as a seeker. Now, we are going to talk about transmission because it is very important for us to establish this because when we get into this discussion, we must approach it in the right spirit 
and we must approach it in the right way. But let's talk about the skeptic. All right. And I'm going to read first uh, Romans chapter 1. I want to read a couple of verses from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that we may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible god into the image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things wherefore god also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own body between themselves who changed the truth of god into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen i am approaching this teaching talking to seekers you know there are some people that have questions there are some people that have legitimate question okay yes there's some people that raise question is the bible the word of god can i believe the bible and they want answers they are open to dialogue they want to talk but one of the things i found out is that skeptics are those people that have made up their mind that even when you confront them with the fact even when you confront them with the evidence they still agree and i'm going to show you an example today that as we are studying this, we are believing that we are speaking to you as a seeker. If maybe you are a Christian, or maybe you are not a Christian, but you are praying and asking God to show you the truth that the Bible is the word of God. And if you are a true seeker, whether a Christian or somebody that is asking questions, I believe this teaching is for you. Unfortunately, there are skeptics that they are not really interested in the truth. The Bible says that these people, he said that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Oftentimes, a lot of this skeptic is not because of lack of evidence. Unfortunately, oftentimes it's because they have made up their mind, they have determined to make themselves the enemy of the truth. They have decided to yield themselves as instrument in the hand of the enemy. And that oftentimes is the spirit that drives some of these people that bash the scripture, that want to, you know, want to attack the truth. And, and sometimes you look at those people and, and, and try to have an honest discussion with them and you soon realize that they are not really interested in dialogue. They are much more interested in trying to destroy the truth. The Bible says that that which may be known of God is manifested to them. For God has shown it to them. The Bible says they are without excuse. And a whole lot of those people, and I've said this on this platform before, nobody will reject Christianity. Nobody will reject Jesus Christ. Nobody will claim to be an atheist because of lack of evidence. Nobody will, will reject Jesus Christ on intellectual ground. Now, people can reject him because they, they make a decision to... Okay, that's their prerogative. But the truth is that no honest person can reject Jesus Christ, can reject the Bible, can reject God purely based on intellectual reason or intellectual ground. Because I say it again and again and again, Christianity makes sense. Oftentimes, most, most people that attack Christianity, we know them for their attack. And the question is, what is alternative do they provide what alternative does agnotism provide what alternative what answer to the question of life where are we from why are we here where are we going what happened after that why is there evil why do the good people suffer what alternative explanation do all these school of thought what alternative answer do they provide
and compare that to what the Bible provides for us in the scripture. Verse 22 of that Romans chapter 1 says that professing themselves to be wise, they became fool. Verse 25 says they changed the truth of God into a lie. And that is what I've seen. You know, I'm taking time to talk about this because we are going to talk about a couple of things, talking about transmission. And I'm going to show you how, you know, people can be so dishonest. And I'm going to give you a living example. How people can be so dishonest with fact. How people can be so dishonest with evidence. And unfortunately, some of these people overthrow the faith of many. But nobody have an excuse because we all have the Bible. We all now have Facebooks and YouTubes and nobody have an excuse. Everybody can search the scripture, can read the scripture. And if you have a question about the Bible that you don't understand, there are so many resources now. If you are really, really honest about the truth, there are so many resources today. Nobody can turn around today and say, I didn't know. Okay. What I find out oftentimes is that, like the Bible says, that a time will come when people will gather for themselves teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. What I find out is that oftentimes the, peop- the problem is that people love darkness and not light. And, I'm, and, and, and that is why I'm talking about this. Let me give you a good living example. I want to show you two people. William Lane, Greg, I'm using as a seeker. I mean, it's a Christian. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody that either knows the truth or wants to know the truth. And but Eman as somebody who is a skeptic. First, William Lane, Greg is a research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology and professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. He's an analytic philosopher. He's a Christian theologian. He's an evangelist. Is an author and he has edited around 40 books. He earned PhD in philosophy in Birmingham, England, and doctorate in theology in Munich, Germany. This gentleman, if you've not been hearing him, seek him out. He has quite a number of books and he has quite a number of videos on YouTube. He's a man I love to listen to. But let's look at Bart Ehrman. He's an example of a skeptic. Now, Bart Ehrman is a professor of religious study at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's an American New Testament scholar focusing on textual criticism of the New Testament and historical Jesus, the origin and development of early Christianity. He was a born-again fundamentalist Christian as a teenager. During his graduate study, however, he became convinced that there are contradictions and discrepancies in the Bible manuscript that could not be harmonized or reconciled. He remained a liberal Christian for 15 years, but later became an agnostic atheist. Now, the reason why I've told you about Bart is that it's one of the people that the devil have used to bash the Bible. He's actually a scholar. He's actually a brilliant scholar. I mean, obviously, concerning faith, he has become shipwrecked. I mean, this man is a scholar. He's a New Testament scholar. And by all intent and purpose, a very good one. He's a professor of religious study. He focuses on textual criticism. In other words, he's somebody that should know the truth, that should know the fact. Okay. I've, I've watched a few number of the video that this man did. I remember watching, quite recently, he was trying to ridicule, he was trying to, he was trying to pull down, destroy the, the teaching of, of Trinity in the Bible. And one of the things that struck me is this, look, you can have honest question, you can have honest doubt. The problem is when people are dishonest. I mean, here is a scholar. I mean, this guy is a scholar. And even I that don't have any degree in theology, I was, I was ashamed because what he was doing was to pre- pre- present a caricature of the doctrine of Trinity and then went on to attack it. And this is the spirit of the skeptics. Remember, there are people that have questions, but they are seeking to find answer. But the spirit behind these people is that they are not really looking for a dialogue. They just want to destroy. This guy, I mean, this is a professor. 
that was presenting the doctrine of Trinity as if Christians serve three gods. And you present a caricature of something and you go ahead and attack the caricature that you have presented. And that was why William called Bart, good Bart and bad Bart. You will see him on many secular social media, secular TV, because these are the type of, because this is what people want to hear. And what then tend to happen is that when Bart goes on these places, okay, it, it presents a face, you know, there is a face it presents on TV, and that is what William called the bad bat, <laughs> the bad bat. Because he will be careless in, in his presentation, and, and I'm going to show you one or two things that he said. He will be careless in his presentation, he will be dishonest with fact, he will tell people what they want to hear, but when he is among scholars, he present another part. You know, he will say things on TV, he will write things on books that people buy. I don't know whether he's been driven, he's definitely been driven by the spirit of the Antichrist and the spirit of the devil. Maybe he's been driven by mammon, money. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Because I don't understand how somebody can be a professor of New Testament. You're supposed to be uh, an expert in textual, you know, criticism, and yet you are the one that is being used to propagate lies and dishonesty. And oftentimes what he tend to do, and a lot of these skeptics, is that they will mix a little bit of truth with a little bit of poison. And this type of people can be very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Because you see, because people trust them, because number one, he used to be a Christian, number two, he's a scholar, people think he must know what he's saying. But like I said, nobody have an excuse. Actually, I call him double-faced, but because this man is obviously willingly dishonest, and it's not just him. Let me give you an example of some of the things that he has said. He was talking about the New Testament manus manuscript. He said, and these New Testament manuscript copies all differ from one another. In many thousands of places, these copies differ from each other in so many places that we don't even know how many differences there are. Not only do we not have the originals, we don't even have copies of the copies of the originals or copies of the copies of the copies of the original. You know, if an illiterate in the study of textual criticism says this, we may forgive him. We may make excuse for him. I mean, for somebody who is a scholar in textual criticism to say this, it is embarrassing. And what tends to happen is that when scholar, when his, his mate call him to, to question, he back away. But unfortunately, that doesn't stop him from going to social media and propagate and promote this lie. What happened here is he has again mixed a little bit of the truth with a lot of lies. And he's been dishonest with the fact. He's been dishonest with the truth. And I'm going to come, not in this section, I'm going to come back by the grace of God and show you that here, I mean, I'm not a scholar in, in New Testament textual criticism. I'm not even close to it. But this is a, an intelligent man who is dishonest with the truth. Bible says that which may be known of God is manifested in them for God. This man knows the truth because he's a scholar. He's without excuse. He professed himself to be wise, but he has become fool. He has changed the truth of the word of God into lie. There's nothing I'm going to say for a man like this that is new. There's no information I can bring that will change a man like this because he knows exactly what I'm going to say. Despite the evidence, I mean, for him to say what he said, we wonder what is the spirit that is driving this individual, okay? And and this is why we are, we have, have have said all this to bring you to what we are going to do. Not today. We are going to leave this by the grace of God until next time. We are going to talk about textual criticism because when we come to this area 
of dealing with the Bible, dealing with the text of the Bible, when we come to this area of talking about copying the Bible, when we come to this area of translating the Bible, this is the area of textual criticism. Now, I mean, obviously, like I said, I'm not a scholar, but it is very, very important for us, you know, for us to talk about, you know, the text of the Bible, okay? We've talked about the fact that they are copied, and we talk about the fact that they are then translated. It is true that they are copied and copied and copied and copied. It is true. But what Bart was doing there is actually trying to blindfold people to the truth. Copies of copies, so there's nothing new in that. So that is why I want to introduce you. We are just going to introduce it today to textual criticism. Textual criticism is an academic enterprise used to reconstitute all document of antiquity, not just religious text. The Bible is one of many ancient documents. In fact, there are a number of documents that are older than the Bible. Textual criticism is an academic enterprise used to reconstitute all documents of antiquity, not just religious text. It is a careful analytical process. Now, listen to this allowing an alert critic to determine the extent of possible corruption of any work and given certain condition, reconstruct the original with high degree of certainty. Since the original autograph does not exist, we depend on faithful transmission of the test. Nobody expect the original, the original test of ancient manuscript. Nobody expect the original text to survive. That is why they are document of antiquity. Because in those days, they did not have ways to document this thing in a way that will last forever. Okay? So for somebody to say the original is not here, is actually saying the obvious and being intentionally mischievous. Textual criticism understand with the human process of translation, there exists the potential of transmittal error. We know that we cannot have the original, okay? And we know that this ancient document, this document of antiquities have to be copied, has to be translated, has to be copied again and again and again and again, okay? That, it, it has to be that way, okay? Then number two, Textual criticism also know that in the process of copying, because again, like we said the last time, there was no fax machine, there was no photocopying machine in those days. We know that in the process of copying and copying and copying, there will be mistakes. There will be typo, or let me say, copying mistake. In fact, if that is not the case, then something is wrong. Textual criticism understand with the human process of translation, there exists the potential of transmitter error. And therefore, textual criticism examines the internal and external evidences in order to arrive at such conclusion as the date, the authorship of the book, and the legitimacy of the textual reading. There's a way to examine every document of antiquity, every ancient document that has been passed to us that we have their copies. There are ways to examine them, okay? And the Bible is not an exemption. What tends to happen, and this is the problem, what tends to happen is people are so dishonest, people like Bart are so dishonest, they use, they use a different measure, they use a different ruler for other ancient writings, let's say other, and unfortunately, they want to use a different one for the Bible. Look, the Bible and this other, they are, they are both ancient writing. What we are saying is that there are tools, okay? So there are, let's, let's put it here. There are tools that you can apply to, to these things that we are calling textual criticism. There are tools that you can use that will actually help you, number one, to determine the extent of the mistake, and it also help you to reconstruct the original with high degree of certainty. And Bart Herman 
knows this. They look at internal and external evidences. Regardless of the raw number of variants, can we recover the original reading with confidence? That is the question that textual critics is trying to answer. The answer to that pivotal question depends on three factors. This is brilliant. And this is what Bart and people like him are trying to cover up because they know that if people know the truth, they will know that the Bible is in a class of its own among other ancient documents, among other documents of antiquity. So the answer to that pivotal question depends on these three factors. And I'm going to come by the grace of God next time to talk about these three factors. These are the tools that textual criticism use to cross-examine ancient writing. First, they will ask the question, how many copies exist? Two, they will ask, how old are the manuscript, the copies? Three, they will then ask, what is the exact nature of the mistake, the differences, the variant? You understand that I'm simplifying this, okay? We are talking about it from our own level. Let's say this is a manuscript. Yes, we don't have the original. You want to ask, how, how can you be confident that what you are holding in your hand is a true representation of the original? These are the three, the three questions they ask themselves. How many copies is it? How many manuscripts do you have? Number two, those manuscripts you have, how old are those manuscripts? How close to the original are they? Number three, and this is very important. You know, all these things that you call mistakes, and you know, these people like to use the word corrupt. Uh, they, 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 they like to use that word corrupt. No, the Bible has been corrupted. But the word they actually use is variant. You know, to corrupt something is to intentionally want to dupe people. You know, to intentionally want to put what is not there, to intentionally want to put it there. No, a lot of these things are not people corrupting the document, okay? For example, if somebody want to steal money, okay, embezzle money. He can corrupt account. But somebody can honestly make a mistake when adding. There are two different things. So they talk about variant. They talk about mistakes, differences. But the thing is this, then you have to ask yourself, how many copies? How old are the manuscript? What is the exact nature? What is the exact nature of these mistakes? This thing that all these people got corrupt. They will be shocked. What is the exact nature of this variant that they are talking about? But let's end with a simple statement. Pleasure criticism has affirmed that we possess a biblical text that is highly accurate and reliable. Textual criticism has affirmed that we possess a biblical text that is highly accurate and reliable. We're going to take it off from there next time by the grace of God. I want you to know that the Bible you have in your hand is the word of God. Don't let any bad man, don't let them deceive you. I don't know if you are listening to me and you have honest questions. There are answers out there. Don't let anybody pull the wool over your face. And if you are listening to me and you are not born again, you need to invite Jesus Christ. God loves you. And that is why we are doing this. Okay, don't let the God of this world take you to hell. 